Hello, everybody. It is 10.05. We'll just go ahead and get started. I'm being told that everyone can see my the slide that's up. So I would very much like to welcome you to the Louisiana Digital Library Speaker Series. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to welcome all of you here. My name is S.L. Ziegler. I'm the head of digital programs and services at LSU Libraries. And I'm the project manager for the LDLS data grant, which makes today's speaker series possible. By way of introduction today, I'm going to say just a few things about the grant and how the Louisiana Digital Library fits into it. Before that, though, a few housekeeping items. Um, I'll remind you that we all agree to the code of conduct, which states in part harassment of participants will not be tolerated in any form. If things go, if we feel like we have to today, and we hope we don't, if things necessitate it, we will shut the today's session down. Um, and Dorothy has agreed that we will likely just record it and put it up. But we hope we can do this in front of a live audience without without a problem. Um, I do want to say that this talk is being recorded and will be available on the LDL website. And we hope to have it up in the near future. We'll email all registrants when it's ready, as well as advertising on the usual channel. So please do follow Louis and Digital Library and all of your favorite social media platforms. I'll also say, because it's being recorded, I just want to take a second to remind you that the chat is not private. So if you have something secret to say, please text your friend or use Slack or Gchat. There are so many options. And if it's really, really bad, consider using Signal. So that being said, please do use the chat to ask questions or share resources. My colleague, Leah Power Duncan, and I will be uh, keeping an eye on the chat and trying to moderate that. And we'll share them out during the question and answer portion of today's talk. And lastly, we'll be using the hashtag that you see here on the screen, the LDLS data, should you want to contribute and follow along on Twitter. So we are all here together because of the Collections as Data, data Part to Whole grant with, fun, with funds from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, re-granted to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. LSU Libraries and the Louisiana Digital Library is part of a cohort charged with creating examples of how to operationalize the use of digital cultural heritage material as data. And we are thrilled to be part of this cohort. If you haven't yet had a chance to familiarize yourself with all the other great projects involved, I encourage you to do so at your convenience. So our part of the collections as data part, the whole project is investigating what it would mean to make the entirety of the Louisiana Digital Library available as data. So for context, the LDL is Louisiana's statewide digital repository for cultural heritage material with over 30 participating institutions, including public libraries, academic libraries, archives, and museums. And we know that this a project of this scale and complexity will include both a technical angle in which we build out APIs and bulk download possibilities and download uh, various means. And we know there's a lot of work to do in this area and, and many technical things to figure out. But much more essential to our project, at least to date, is the community work that this entails. Because we're thinking about what we can get out of the LDL in terms of the data to use and reuse in various forms, we also need to think very carefully about what goes into the LDL. So doing so invites questions about digitization selection, conscientious metadata remediation, as well as evaluations of what collections should not, in fact, be widely shared, because we know that not everything should be treated the same way. And it's because of these questions and many others that we launched the speaker series. So we want to learn together. And because we know the LDL is not alone in this journey, we're so happy to see so many wonderful people join us today beyond the state. This morning, we have over 100 participants for this event from over 70 institutions across the country and beyond. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to take a moment to invite you to attend all full speaker series. You can see the complete list of speakers in the URL listed here. I'll just talk briefly about the next two. Dr. Tanya Sutherland, Assistant Professor in the Department of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, will join us on November 19th for a talk entitled Making Culturally Responsive Decisions About Redescription in the Louisiana Digital Library. In this talk, Dr. Sutherland will identify some current best practices for culturally responsive decision making and will identify developing practices that model archival harm reduction, such as community centered description and pre digitization remediation making recommendations for culturally responsive redescription in the LDL. On December 3rd, we'll be joined by Jessica Perkins-Smith, 
university archivist and assistant professor at Mississippi State University, whose talk, Digitizing Mississippi, Black Voices and White Supremacy, will explore the process of facing the history of Jim Crow era racism and finding ways to ensure stories of Black resistance to white supremacy are illuminated, while at the same time creating the means for students and researchers to understand the fear and violence that allowed segregationists to maintain power for so long in the state. I hope you'll be able to join us for these talks, as well as the other guests, about whom you can read, again, with the link on the slide. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dorothy Berry. Dorothy is the Digital Collections Project Manager at Halton Library at Harvard University, where she is currently working on a large project to highlight African-American materials in the collection. Previously, Dorothy worked as the Metadata and Digitization Lead for the Umbra Search African-American History at University of Minnesota, a project to make African-American history more broadly accessible through digitization and search capacity. Before that, she was a Mellon Fellow at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. Dorothy has both an MLS and an MA from Indiana University. Dorothy is a widely sought after speaker on the topic of digitization, selection, digital description, and all things related to descriptive equity in the field of cultural heritage material. As some of you may know, this is the third public event Dorothy has done this week. We are so thankful for her leadership, patience, and willingness to share her work. And I'm delighted to have her today speaking to us about centering the margins and digital project planning. And Dorothy, I'm so happy to say I'm finally done talking and I will turn the screen sharing powers over to you. Thank you, that's very flattering. So like um, SL just said, I'm gonna talk about digitization selection criteria and different ways to approach that programmatically in ways that specifically work to, as I put it, center the margins. So a little bit of introduction um, beyond those uh, very glowing words from SL. Uh, you know, I'm coming to you from my home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I mainly grew up on a farm in the Missouri Ozarks. This photograph is of the um, Colored Children's School in my hometown and in the front row is my grandf grandfather and in the other rows you see some uncles and cousins of mine. I went to school in California and actually I noticed in the um, attendees there appears to be someone who I worked with is an undergraduate circulation assistant, uh, another one of my undergrad peers at that school. And I also went to Indiana and most of my training and professional experience is working with African American Special Collections. I manage digital collections at Houghton Library, which is Harvard's biggest repository for rare books and manuscripts. Today, we're gonna to talk about different methods for building a digital collections program that focuses on ensuring the centrality of diverse histories in our archival and special collections. I'm gonna start off with the discussion plan to give an idea of how this conversation will play out. There are so many institution specific issues around organizational structure and funding that I'm boldly going to try and avoid some of those specifics, fundamental though they are to the practicalities of getting anything done in library land. At the same time, I'm not planning on discussing grant applications and funding, fundamental though they are to getting digital projects approved at most institutions. While it may seem like I'm skipping over some of the biggest elements at hand, don't worry that it's accidental. I'm also not gonna delve too deeply into post-custodial digitization and community archives work. There are fantastic resources around digital project management, community archives, and grant applications from organizations like Digital Library Foundation and Society of American Archivists, and I'm very willing to discuss those um, in Q&A time. And I want to acknowledge all the great work that my colleagues who have more specialization and experience in those areas have than I. I'm instead going to talk about what I see as the sorts of digital collections building we can do looking directly at the materials we have on hand, whatever those may be. Regardless of the specifics of the collection, there are ways to consciously center histories that have traditionally been pushed to the margins by universities, historical societies, and all sorts of folks with the power to write the record. Drawing on my still in progress experience building a digital collections program from the ground up at Houghton, I'm gonna cover three large areas, the why, how, and what. Foundations, the whys of making underrepresented histories central to digitization. Resources, the hows of what's needed to make that happen, and program development, the what and the outcomes we can try to develop. The foundations are, I hope, already something we're all thinking about, especially in this current moment. 
While there is recurring a debate around how much does our work matter, the extreme changes in physical access, with the extreme changes in physical access, digital collections and access have become core to syllabi and research plans where they were previously seen as a last resort. The selections we've made in the past directly affect the selections researchers and instructors are making today. I've seen numerous scholars on Twitter telling each other that they just need to focus on materials that are already available online and not spend too much time trying to get that perfect document digitized. This directly calls to attention how past decisions shape what gets into the classroom. Not prioritizing digitizing marginalized people's materials in the past means those materials are not getting into 2020's classroom. This topical concern should be a permanent one as we adapt more and more to online teaching and digital methodologies. As series organizer SL Ziegler pointed out in their excellent article on anti-racist selection for digitization, not only does the digital corpus we create affect what materials researchers can reference, they play an outsized impact on the sorts of computational research that can be done from digital collections. Digital scholarship that depends on a large body of digitized materials is directly shaped by our choices. Beyond the obvious audiences for those of us who work for colleges and universities, the audience for digital collections is huge. I've often heard suggestions squashed with, well, our researchers are interested in this, or we get the most requests for this in the reading room. Digital collections open the library's door to everyone with internet access, requiring a reconception of who our user base really is. This broadening of access makes it even more imperative to ensure that we are creating digital collections that reflect the diverse interests and backgrounds that exist in our holdings. Now that we've got a common ground on foundations, I wanna discuss resources. As I acknowledged at the outset, every institution has its own strengths and weaknesses in this area. So this is going to be less about Gantt charts and budgets and more about thinking programmatically when it comes to creating digital collections. Thinking programmatically means evaluating the resources at hand and figuring out a balance that can produce results, even if they aren't necessarily the results of your dreams. Working at Houghton Library has meant, for example, that the financial angle has not been the strongest concern, but the Byzantine levels of hierarchy and bureaucracy that underlie any move at a place as large and old as Harvard makes staffing and time issues larger than one might expect. In my institution, I manage metadata creation, project selection, and management, but have to interact with multiple committees, colleagues, and departments outside of my libraries to actually get any single item digitized and deposited in our institutional repository. So these building blocks of resources, which again may seem very fundamental or very obvious, but they're really important to have in mind at the outset of this sort of planning, are your funding models, your staffing, the materials you have on hand, and then time, which I separate from staffing, because even if you have a ton of people, rarely do we have the amount of uh, concentrated focus that we can really allow for anything to just be planned out as free as we want. So time balancing with your staffing, and then of course the actual physical time that it takes to digitize the items, which depending on what we're talking about can be quite a lot. We all have different setups around staffing, funding, and infrastructure. Some things will make perfect sense at some institutions and some will sound humorously out of reach. Regardless of resources though, we can all do something. Really evaluating the resources at hand is key. The desire for digitization keeps increasing and the amount of labor required is like so much behind the scenes library work under acknowledged and underappreciated. I think this is especially true in a time where many people, especially people that have access to universities, have on hand a camera on their phone that is incredibly high quality and can take great pictures. It's very hard to imagine for the layperson the amounts of the layers that exist, your metadata creation, your institutional repository, your project development, because they just think, why can't you take these pictures for me? Or why haven't you just uploaded these pictures? And sometimes it is that simple, but a lot of times it's not. And now for the actual bulk of the presentation. With the why and how covered, it's time to dig into the how. Using experiences gained working to establish a digital collections program at Houghton that centers anti-racist selection criteria along our other practical needs, I'm gonna lay a path towards functional programmatic collections building. 
When I arrived, the bulk of our digitization came about through patron requests or through curator requests. We receive a high volume of patron requests and are glad to fill them to the best of our ability. We have currently shifted majorly our workflows to bring people back on site four days a week, specifically to provide free reference scans for researchers and high quality scans for classes and sometimes for materials that are of a condition that cannot be scanned without professional um, tools. This ad hoc digitization method, however, has historically meant two things. It was really difficult to get a curatorial understanding of what our digital collections actually were, and that our digitization tended to reflect the research interests of our patrons, which were biased by both the traditions of the academy and by the available knowledge of our collections. This is always a difficulty in libraries because one of our core values is, of course, to serve those patrons who come in. Digital collections, as I said earlier, though, open up the idea of who our patrons are. And sometimes if we have created a community that only welcomes a certain group of people or that a certain group of people have felt uh, home in, we are actually ignoring our patrons that we don't even know about. So I'm gonna talk about this sort of dichotomy I'm setting up here of ad hoc digitization of patron driven collection development which often comes about just simply as a type of triage and programmatic digitization where we balance the resources limited though they may be to meet new opportunities of collection building. The move towards thoughtfully and actively selective programmatic digitization was necessary to ensure that we were meeting the goals of increasing diversity in the materials available online and making sure that there was a greater sense of equality across the library. At my library, curators had the biggest authority on what collections should be for a digital project, but collections knowledge is not always so concentrated. So putting aside the immediacy of patron digitization, we have opportunities to plan out our work in ways that actively pursue our diverse representation goals. Opening up the doors of who decides what's digitized, what criteria projects are judged on and how we prioritize our ongoing work can lead to workflows that don't require reinventing the wheel every year or every time someone has a great new project idea. Figuring out the best approach to move from ad hoc organization to organized meant, of course, reviewing the work of colleagues at other libraries. I have given a few webinars in our remote period and I'm constantly amazed at the work folks are producing and even more so by the willingness of people in the field to give their time to assist. Looking at work done at, by colleagues at Harvard Law Library and colleagues at University of Minnesota, I decided the best option for my particular setup was to create a sort of internal mini grant competition. So first there was getting out the word about this process, promoting the submission process internally across departments, including departments who traditionally had no say in what got digitized. If possible, I would recommend, and I hope in the future we can at my library, open up the process more widely and promote that through outreach, but to faculty, students, researchers, and the broader community, which is something my colleagues at the law library had done. Next was to create a simple submission process, asking project submitters to explain their proposal and justify their work's value on a variety of axes. Online options like a form make it easy to track data. This was challenging because people were not, at my library, were not used to having to really defend their ideas across a variety of criteria. For some people, it was an exciting new opportunity. And for some people who were more used to just getting done what they wanted done, it was less exciting. However, the equalizing factor and the way that it smoothed out the longer term workflows is really beneficial. And then finally, selection. We formed a committee of stakeholders to review and select submissions based on a shared weighted rubric that was available to anyone at the library on our documentation wiki. With streamlined organizing, this process was accomplished with minimal meetings and only one true in-person meeting to really go through the applications and that only took about 40 minutes. I created the project submission form that asked submitters to describe the collection but more importantly, to really describe specifically the benefits of digitization. The form asks about the possibilities for classroom use, for digital scholarship, ways that the collection highlights underrepresented histories, conservation concerns that could be alleviated through digitization, and so on. This introduced an entirely new way of looking at digitization for a lot of staff who had previously not considered it deeply at all. 
and it definitely ruffled the feathers of some who weren't used to having to describe and defend their proposals. It also opened up a complete, completely new areas of expertise. Our music catalogers in particular made proposals for materials that no one else would have thought of and no one else could have known the value of. So looking at ways of sort of creating selection criteria, I've separated them into these three areas that have a lot of overlap. The first and one that I think is very core is the diversity and representation. So weighing the enhancement of the representation of the materials we've digitized. And I think it's important to weight that as strongly as, if not more so, traditional concerns for digitization like prestige of getting people's awareness of our finest items out there and also preservation. On the other hand, access and preservation are core functions of putting things online, especially when we're working with very fragile materials that handling damages and could potentially destroy. And then finally, as I think we're all exceedingly aware of in 2020, but we should be aware of at all times, teaching and learning. So remote teaching and learning have increased, but also we have to think about accessibility. Our digitization um, provides materials for patrons who both financially, physically, potentially depending on the institution, emotionally cannot access our reading rooms. So we are really making decisions about what some, about what some people can access. After multiple presentations and one-on-one -on -one conversations sharing the submission process and logic to my library, I formed a rotating committee to review the submissions. Using a similar ranking process to those for conference proposals or grant reviews, I assigned numerical value to different form categories and brought a group together from across the library to rank and discuss. We were able to use knowledge from different departments to evaluate our colleagues' submissions and provide a sense of transparency in the decision-making process. In the future, I'd love to increase the perspectives by inviting faculty, student, and other community members to serve on the committee. So at my library, we have three divisions of public services, technical services, and collections. And our committee has representation from each of those divisions, as well as me as a standing member, and then people from our imaging services department as officio members. And we also have made, I have made a strong effort to try to make sure that the people on the committee are as often as can be some of our colleagues who are less likely to be invited to be on these sorts of committees, um, colleagues who are maybe earlier career and can benefit from this experience, as well as colleagues who have deep institutional knowledge that they bring to the table in terms of questions of, well, does this get used very often or how popular is this in classes and so forth. We implemented this process at Houghton Library for a first run cycle in 2019. With that new rotating committee with representation from across collection divisions, we reviewed 17 project proposals ranging from selections of three or four items to entire archival collections of over 140 Hollanders. For the first time, we were selecting projects through an equitable process that was open across the library. This required more work than people were used to and more work for committee members as well. But it also more accurately reflected the amount of work and planning that needs to go into successful digital projects. By making increasing representation into a weighted factor, we required all submitters to think about how their proposals fit into our larger library goals around diversity and inclusion. Ongoing workflows create stability and allow for long-term planning. But sometimes there are opportunities to divert resources or receive new resources to dedicate completely to projects that serve the goal of increasing representation. This year at Houghton Library, we've paused our new project admission process to focus on digi digitizing materials only related to African-American history and culture. Projects like these can sometimes receive critiques like, isn't this just reverse racism? Isn't this library affirmative action? Looking back at many of our institutions track records, however, Special projects are often necessary in response to long histories of exclusion. The idea for a total pause was a bold one at my library. Our projects and progress were all fantastic, and many of them are in high demand from patrons. At the height of the summer, I received multiple requests from across the library, not just Houghton, but Harvard Library, for images of African Americans from our digital collections for social media or blog posts. I was struck both by how unfamiliar our library was with our holdings in this area, and then by how truly scant the numbers were. New systematic workflows are beneficial in establishing best practices and inviting new voices, 
but it is beneficial to create special projects that exist outside the proposal process and are specially designed to increase access to underrepresented people's materials, especially when it's clear that there are huge gaps. There are also purely practical reasons behind a total pause. Limited resources may not be able to accomplish the ongoing project workflow alongside large special projects. Being flexible and open to possibilities is a key in a constantly shifting cultural environment. Our project, which I see my colleague Christine, who's one of the team members is on the call as well, which is fantastic. Our project, Slavery, Abolition, Emancipation and Freedom, Primary Sources from Potent Library, is based on a 3,000 plus list of materials I have been building since 2019 in hopes of submitting to my very own project process. Being able to dedicate all the digital project work to this one group of materials has opened up new opportunities for us beyond just digitization. So our project has four key parts. The first is education, so forming a cross-departmental team to do research and descriptive work, which requires us all to work on educating ourselves around both the uh, you know, leading scholarship around describing these materials and just the historical issues, which we might not be familiar with. There's the redescription, which we've had to dedicate resources to both uh, remediation of description, adding a shared 830 field, C field so that all these materials can be co-located. And then as I discovered, actually cataloging a lot of the materials as there were a great number of uh, bound volumes that I assumed were fully cataloged, but in fact had multiple pamphlets inside that were not listed anywhere. Digitization, which is the you know, obvious key part of a digital project, that requires scheduling out over time, especially with these new cataloging description needs, and with the fact that this is a remote learning period, so our digitization services at their core need to serve with the highest priority teaching and learning needs. And then discovery, so we're using the tools we have at hand, like co-location from to creating a publicly available data set, working with our colleagues in research data and to using the, uh, I guess, built-in digital collections platform that Harvard Libraries offers to its uh, community. So as I mentioned, something that comes up with this sort of work is the argument that it can't be done at this library because no one on staff has particular subject knowledge in that area. That's often used to avoid doing projects that can increase uh, representation from our collections. This is one of my least favorite ploys for two reasons. The first is that as librarians and archivists, especially those working with special collections, we are perhaps the most adept folks at gaining familiarity with new material. Every collection process requires digging into a new person, history, geography. The second is that since most of us don't have unlimited staff budgets, this argument either locks out all projects that don't focus on the things the current staff know about, or it promotes hiring people from marginalized backgrounds into contingent positions that extract knowledge without providing real support and add no foundational strength to our libraries. While we can't all become actual experts in every area, recruiting colleagues with interests in relevant areas and commitment to open communication and education can create a shared knowledge base that has benefits that reach outside of any discrete project. For our project, I wanted to bring in colleagues from across our three departments, technical services, collections, and public services. I was able to invite a collection services colleague with a deep commitment to diversity and inclusion in libraries who serves on RBMS's diversity and inclusion committee, a collections colleague, Christine, who I mentioned earlier, from our modern books and manuscripts area, who has great 19th century knowledge, and our new digital archivist colleague, who has been a huge assistance with our thinking about data and digital collections. We are still in the early stages of this project and the workflows are anything but expected in a time in, of limited resources, limited on-site hours, because although I said we have people going in four days a week, people can only be in the office for four hours tops a day, and staffing. The two major lessons we've learned so far though are being willing to shift priorities, so shifting resources to create impact, working with those limited resources and centering materials we've previously ignored requires this type of reallocation and being willing to dream big and leap over obstacles or at least sneak around them. So promising progress, not perfection. Planning large-scale initiatives is ambitious. When trying to increase representation, especially at our current moment, there could be a desire for any discrete project to be the end-all, be-all, finally, our library is anti-racist, we've done our project. 
promising progress, not perfection, serves a difficult truth that problems that took many years to create may take many years to fully solve. Developing a digital collections program from the ground up is a difficult journey with ups and downs. Integrating diversifying representation as a core value from the outset establishes a foundation for the type of library history requires and patrons demand. We've been able to move towards this goal at Houghton by establishing clearly documented workflows, but also by being willing to shift gears when the moment is right. There's more detail to discuss, and we certainly can in the Q&A, but we're drawing to the end of my prepared remarks. These examples are far from the only way a library can increase its digital holdings with centering the margins. Archives and special collections have a rich history of speaking neutrality while making strong value judgments, and digital collections provide one of the most democratized access points we have. We all have a responsibility to make sure our work is truly serving the greater good and fulfilling our goal to increase access to information and knowledge. Thank you all for attending and I'm so glad for the Q&A and everyone from Louisiana who participates in the digital library. I hope you've enjoyed these fantastic pictures as I pulled them all from Louisiana Digital Library's great collections. Thank you, Dorothy. That was amazing. I, I very much appreciate it. I don't see any uh, chat questions come in, which is good because that means I get to jump in and do my own. Um, while we have a chance to look at this. And thank you for using the LDL collections. I love that so much. Um, let's see. So I I guess my first question that I have for you is I, I wonder how much of this work that you're describing here, how much of that was in your original job description? I don't think any. Yeah. Um, there probably was the bullet point that we all have about something that's like, you know, we'll work to increase to, that's the, the standard one. Um, they definitely knew it was my subject area when I did my present, like my job talk. But I think that it becoming something that's been really key is something that is definitely widely supported at my library. I just don't know that it was predicted, but they're as on board as anyone could be really. <laughs> Well, there's yeah. a lot of diversity and inclusion. I, I don't want to make it seem like they're, they do actually a huge amount of diversity and inclusion committee work and project work at Houghton. It's something people are really interested in, but there's not necessarily as much uh, professional experience in that region. And and you mentioned before some of the pushback, especially with this, this large project in which all the other special projects are paused. Um, and, and you mentioned, I think, uh, it being it take the pushback taking the form, for instance, of reverse racism. Um, can you say a little bit about how you handle that? So you you said in the presentation that uh, that that might you know what, what you're doing now counteracts the history of our institutions. But maybe speaking to somebody who's not an archivist or a librarian, I'm sort of yeah. curious about how you, how you frame well, that. I think to someone who's not an archivist or a librarian, what's really important to make clear is that you know maybe a year ago, two years ago, all of the projects were white people. So I, and I'm not, and I am not actively calling that racist. So if it's reversed racist for this year to be only African American materials, well, I guess then we're saying the library has a long history. I would never say that, which is, you know, that sort of response people don't really think about this. And then for this particular project we're doing, so we're pulling from the materials Houghton Library has about African American history, a lot of them are not created by African Americans. So we have, you know, so many copies of amazing abolitionist pamphlets. We have these meeting notes, things like that. These tell stories that directly influence African-American history and also the research of African-American history. But the idea that things are, um, the idea that there are these silos is not reflective of the collections. But usually what I would say to someone not in archives is tell them the truth that like, we do amazing collections, but you look for African American materials from Houghton, it's real hard to find them in our digital collections. And we have them. So, you know, it's not as if, which I wouldn't have a problem with, but it's really not as if this is, we've been doing a little bit and now I want to do a lot. It's a direct response to if you are looking for, you know, 20th century Russian material, we have so much of that online. 
because we have rich collections there, hundreds and thousands of pages. So it's it truly is a just an equal level response. You know, it's a small drop in the pool. I see a question in the chat from Kayla. Um, she says, my colleagues are vehemently against having to submit forms to justify their interest in digitizing certain collections. Are there any other ways you would suggest handling or tracking potential collections for digitization? Well, first of all, I'll say, I'm sorry that you have to deal with that because it's very frustrating when people don't want to do things to make your job easier. I can think of other options. I mean, part of the, and I'm assuming based on the question, there's some pretty strong power dynamics at hand as well. Thinking of ways that you can get these, um, I'm trying to pull back up so I can see the question. So for tracking, I both used Google Forms for their, their submissions and I tend to track my projects on Trello because I like having a dashboard and I also like sharing that out with them. So I'll, rec I'll put a plug for that app. They don't sponsor me, I'm just putting it out there. Um, but in terms of other ways to get collection ideas, I might think, depending on the way your library is set up, this could be an opportunity for open meetings. If they really, if people are not willing to put something on paper, having meetings, maybe having an open period where people can email you their submission ideas. It's much harder to do anything that actually reaches some sort of um, equity in those types of cases, because one of the benefits of having a form is that you can say, you know, beyond any quantit qualitative conversations, here were the answers you submitted on a scale. So what I did on my form was a lot of, you know, would this digitization is serve conservation needs one for not at all, five for it's falling apart, please digitize it right now. So it's like, you know, numerical score is really helpful. Um, but if people aren't willing to do that type of work, I think you have to sort of just put as many boundaries up as you can for your own ease, but it's not gonna be that easy. All right, Janine Finn is asking, um, she says, I appreciate your reminder about the long view in working with marginalized collections, um, that problems that took many years to create will take many years to address. Do you have suggestions for finding ways to keep momentum going, ways to build anti-racist work into programs that persist? Yeah, so I think that's a really great question. And I think for me, the key, the key to making this part of persistent work is to, um, sort of as much as you can mentally separate anti-racist work from a political moment or the cultural moment and think of it more just in terms of best practices. So if we're doing, you know, these are the rules for how you write a finding aid, they're given to us by DAX. And also part of our rules are these anti-racist uh, descriptive rules perhaps as an example. And the same with this, um, the digital collections form where you know, under increasing representation is a weighted factor, but so is on an equal level, uh, potential for digital scholarship use or on an equal level, uh, faculty interest. And so things tend to even out that way when you make this work not special projects or not even, you know, a division of the diversity and inclusion committee's 2021 20, goals, but just part of the regular work, which it should be. And I think that that can be an issue sometimes when we establish separate projects and separate goals or separate even employees is that it's easy to think, well, that's the people that do the anti-racist work and I do this other work. But if it's supposed to be a core value that you carry with you, it'll just be part of the work. Mm -hmm. Zach Stein asks, um, how to deal with making potentially sensitive information available, such as lists with KKK names and potentially risking blowback from descendants that could try and hurt the special collections or university? Should archivists worry about this? My personal opinion is that, and again, as you saw from those, um, my background, have I worked in the South, in the deep South? Nope. Um, I don't think archivists should worry about that. On the other hand, I do know that that can have really big impacts on things. You know, you can have your donor relations issues. You can have administration coming back at you. I think that at the end of the day, a list with KKK names, for example, is only sensitive information because people made a choice to join a group, you know, um, which is hard and, 
Yeah. So I think for me, you have to sort of make that stuff as available as you would anything else of the era. You know, if you wouldn't put, depending on your individual library's policy, if you wouldn't put names from a list from the 70s up, if it was a social organization that is not based on, uh, you know, anti-Catholicism and anti-Blackness, then sure, you might say, I'm not putting up this list because we have a 50 year moratorium, which some places have. If it's from the 1930s and it's just a concern that people will be mad that people know their great grandpa was in the Klan. I mean, I'm from the Ozarks and it feels like folks are pretty proud about stuff like that until it's online or something. And I do get, I think that that's a tricky one because obviously there are some local policy issues and also local administrative power issues that maybe as an archivist, you don't have the ability to really work around. But I think it's a general rule. If it's part of a collection that you'd be digitizing for, for good reasons, there's no reason to exclude it. Fletcher Durant has asked, in preparing your project, did you come up with any quantitative data on representation in your digital holdings? That's a really tricky question. And the answer, I mean, the answer is not tricky, no. But it's really tricky to get quantitative data from our digital collections. Harvard is, because it is so big and old, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's a fancy place. Um, <laughs> They, are, they have been a little bit behind on some of the things that other universities are further along on in terms of digital collections. So they launched our first black light based um, digital collections platform last summer. It was Harvard's first like real inclusive of all of its digital holdings collections platform. It's still pretty hard to pull that data out from there. And you know, stuff doesn't go to DPLA yet. The APIs aren't all the way. And that team, our digital strategy initiative team is fantastic. They are doing great work, but that type of data pulling and thinking is not, is, is hard. Another part of why we didn't have the quantitative data is because, um, it's partially because it's hard to know that what material we have, because I was saying so much has been done ad hoc. So the data I did pull that was somewhat quantitative was a listing of the materials we had that were identified as being relevant that were already digitized. It's still qualitative because there could be other things. And so what we've done internally, um, what I've done is sort of just let people know because uh, I've let people know that if they find other things that aren't on our list, because there's a public list for the library and anybody can see it now, um, of the materials we'd selected for digitization that we could add to them. And then also for um, my team, one of, so the way my teams work is because everyone has their own job responsibilities. I had them go to their managers and discuss and figure out what amount of time they could dedicate a month on average. And then we just have sort of a job bank of tasks and everyone can sort of pick a, num pick a task and work on it for a certain amount of time and log that. And one of the tasks we're gonna build into the future is identifying previously digitized material that is relevant to this larger project. But in terms of real quantitative, it's very tough. A lot of the discoveries of there not being relevant things just came from trying to search the digital collections tool to find anything of relevance using a variety of keywords. Jennifer Mullins has asked, are you doing the majority or all of the curatorial work for this initiative or are other contributing identifying or are others contributing identifying collections? So I would say I have done, I guess I could say I'm doing almost all of the curatorial work for this project. Um, partially because I had, as I had said, I had already been, um, oh, sorry. But what I had been, I had already been developing a list. And so when it came together, I could say, oh, I've got 2000 plus items. Uh, which is probably more than we can really get done anyway. So it's already a lot. And then the other is that, but what I have done is set up um, sort of a, a another sheet on the a large sheet of listing for colleagues at Houghton to submit other ideas that they do have because they might, like I was saying, the music librarian submitted a ton of, um, it's actually not relevant for the project, but a ton of really interesting black 18th century from England composed compositions I didn't know about someone else. It's a different project, but we're really neat. So we tried to make it open that way. And then also with faculty, um, because of the remote teaching, we've been getting some more requests from faculty for things that we maybe hadn't identified. And I'm either adding those to the list or depending on the material, I've had two different professors want something for a class that was on our list. So we're just bumping those up to make sure they get them in time. Uh, 
from Sherry in the chat, a similar question about forms um, and about making this work programmatic. Do you have additional advice for folks at institutions where there may be enthusiasm for centering the margins, but resistance to structures that we believe are necessary for doing so for real and at scale? I think in that case, the thing that is beneficial is pointing out the sort of, um, which is, some people can feel a different way about this, but pointing out the benefits that are not only the anti-racist or the representational benefits. So a benefit for having some sort of form submission process is also, you know, there's a personnel benefit, there's a time management benefit, there's a project management benefit. There's also the anti-racist and at the end of the day, um, depending on what people are submitting, it could be actually increasing representation of materials about mar uh, minority religious groups or uh, marginalized sexualities and gender, you know, and because I try to keep that open in case, because there's so many different things and I would hate for us to move forward and have said, okay, great, we've got all this new material, but we're still living out these other groups. Um, so that's how I would sort of think is sort of, it's hard when people are resistant to structures, which is very common libraries for this, even though we have 10,000 committees that we're serving on, nobody ever wants to have some sort of functional structures for them. Um, but yeah, I think sort of bringing up the multi, the multifaceted benefits of having a structure that also go to things that someone who is interested in anti-racism but really is trying to think about the bottom line, well, it helps them to think that this is actually a benefit in terms of time management when that saves money. That sort of, that's how I sort of think of presenting. I try as much as possible in these situations to not sell people what I think is the best idea, but try to figure out what I think they will think is the best part of my idea. No more questions in the chat at the moment. I believe we would have time for more if anyone would like to drop any in. I will uh, jump in again, um, not seeing any more come in. Um, Dorothy, you, you know, we, we've mentioned uh, sort of tongue in cheek, I guess, a couple of times that that Harvard is a, a big fancy place that I think at least some of us have heard of. Um, I wonder, it seems to me, and, and this is, I'm just asking for your thoughts about this. It seems to me that those of us at smaller institutions um, look to larger institutions such as Harvard and, and other large institutions that are doing this for guidance. Um, do you feel like you could have done this or at other institutions? Or do you, I wonder your thoughts about how important it is that you're doing it at Harvard in 2020 as opposed to any, any other institution that you may have spent time at? So I think one of the th reasons I think it's particularly important to do this work at Houghton Library is that our collections are so rich. I mean, they're so rich that you, you know, it's like the classic old song, like so high you can't see over them, so wide you can't see around them. There is so much in these collections. And because of that, that's the sort of thing of, you know, oh, well, African-American materials aren't necessarily our strength. And then you do this looking and it's like, oh no, there's thousands of amazing materials and things I don't know about their importance. Oh, all of a sudden some professors are like, you have this particular pamphlet. Well, that no one knew about that pamphlet. It's the, so for that, I think that to me, I feel like it's the responsibility of an institution that chooses to, you know, hold this type of material to make it accessible. Now, the question of, is this sort of work possible at smaller institutions? There are certain ways, and this is something nobody likes to hear because it feels like, yeah, whatever. But there's certain ways in which it's easier at a smaller institution because of the levels of decision-making and the levels of like bureaucracy that sometimes don't exist in a smaller institution. Um, it can be also harder because the sort of like, we can say I'm putting a pause on project work. It can be much harder to do that sort of thing. But I think in terms of trying to get equitable understanding, I think you can adjust that sort of programmatic work to what you have on hand. You know, if you have a lot of departments of people with really big ideas that you know they're gonna to wanna to submit, maybe you do open it up. If not, however, you know, if I was at a smaller institution there's a chance that I would have done more consulting with people but not had to open it up to everyone in the same way. Because part of the problem coming into my library was that people felt like they didn't have a voice in digitization. And I know at smaller places, sometimes you're like, I'm glad I don't have a voice in that area because I have too many things to do right now. 
So I think that it is very possible to carry um, with you in those smaller institutions. It's just always uh, balancing of what you have on hand. So sometimes, like I said, you know, finances are not a concern. They're not infinite, but they're not a concern in the same way they are at other places. On the other hand, you know, as someone who does a lot of grant reviews, I'll say sometimes smaller institutions, I think, have much more compelling <laughs> grants and arguments than larger places because of the innovation you might build into it or because your library might be um, not required, but might be part of the library's call to do more curriculum integration. And so they might have sometimes the ideas are actually better or the projects can be better on that smaller scale, but it's very hard to get administration to agree to things like let's do a big pivot. That's really scary a lot of times at a smaller place, but at Harvard, we're one of, I don't know, probably one zillion libraries at Harvard, even though we're a big fancy one, there's like a ton of big fancy ones. Uh, great question from Renee that we probably have time for. What advice would you give institutions that are plagued with LTE, uh, limited term employment positions? How do they maintain an uninterrupted program for anti-racist projects when employees are restricted to one to three year contracts? My advice for those institutions are to get their act together and stop hiring people on one to three year contracts. Give everybody permanent employment. It's not ethical, but they won't listen to that advice, um, which has been given far more articulately by other colleagues of mine where advice no one's gonna listen to. So I think that at the end of the day, again, it comes into just, sort of documenting things as part of the best practices for your general workflows. So I, as someone who has gone into contract jobs, uh, you know, you're often given that big document, you know, whatever the documentation is for that department, which is huge and expected to learn a million things in your short period of time. And I think again, sort of making your anti-racist and your inclusive or however you frame it at your institution, making those goals, not, um, not only like sort of emotional conceptual goals, but things that go into your actual work. So if everyone, if it's cataloging and everybody's given a list of approved thesauri, are you including thesauri that represent marginalized people? If everybody goes into a certain, you know, guidelines, do those guidelines tell people if you come across XYZ terms before you digitize it, change, you know, XYZ outdated terms, for example, change them pre-digitization. So, I mean, it's not, it's obviously not the best option in the world, but I think that that sort of thinking of these things as integrated into our work is far more likely to help them sustain in the long term than, you know, only doing special side projects. We've got a couple of people asking if you are willing to share the form that you use. Yes. Awesome. In, in fact, uh, Dorothy, if you're willing, if you share it with us, we'll be able to post it along with this video. Um, yeah, if, I'll share the it, slide deck on the um, form. Perfect, thank you. Um, it looks like, I wanna be respectful, Dorothy, of your time. You've been, um, this has been absolutely fantastic. Maybe we'll just do one more um, question here. Leah, would you be willing to read the, uh, the last one that we have? Mm -hmm, from Charlie. I've been trying to make our black centered collections in particular more visible via adding subject headings, but I'm running into racism and ableism and anti-immigrant sentiment, et cetera, in the subject headings themselves. Part of the problem is that I'm valuing subject headings with URIs for practical reasons, and those tend to be conservative. Should I make a push for using customized local subject headings in order to avoid use of questionable subject headings? That seems yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. Um, it's a great question. And I, I feel your, your pain on that last part about not having that sort of matching flipped thing because we are also slow to integrate that as a usage, which would seems like it would make life a lot easier. <laughs> um, I think uh, creating, depending on the local vocabulary you would want to create, I think a mix of the terms is good. I have done this before with collections where it's clear we're getting, for example, you know, I'm finding multiple collections, multiple folders, multiple materials referencing uh, African-American organization that just doesn't have an approved heading anywhere. And I think that that sort of thing for, cre and you know, I guess theoretically I could have submitted that to NACO and, but guess what? I've never done that. I never will probably. That's, that's just me being bad at rules. But I do think that local vocabularies can be um, 
beneficial in those ways, especially because your goal is to increase visibility and discoverability. And I think that that's really tricky for us because we have all, a lot of us have been trained in that world that these authorities are what make things discoverable, but it doesn't seem like that is the case anymore with the rise of the internet in the ways that it is. So the sort of transferring of cat hard catalogs to the internet is becoming less and less useful for us, especially as patrons are becoming more and more used to the sorts of like amazing research al search algorithms that none of our libraries can afford. I think about this quite often because my brother works for Elasticsearch, which creates a lot of the algorithms for the companies that we use to search for, you know, Bandcamp or something like that, that have great algorithms. I know that our libraries are not going to get that same level because it's expensive. So I think that, you know, if local headings are something that you are approved to do and you can do in a way that is, um, you know, is specific enough to be helpful to the patrons, I say I'm personally a fan of it. I think I, I like to do the combination of both possible if there is a non-incredibly offensive LCA, uh, LCSH that you can find. I think having that and another thing is good, but I do think sometimes um, we are too willing to compromise uh, in order to meet some bigger goal of co-location using approved headings, but what are we doing that co-location for if patrons are really turned off by the terms they're seeing? Yes, that is, that is fantastic. Thank you. Um, that, that's a really good answer. Um, there's a, a link here. So he, uh, Heaven Smith asked, um, and Heaven, this is my, my mistake, I scrolled right past this, was asking whether or not you have suggestions or resources that you would suggest to institutions building policies and procedures for their digital archives to building anti-racist best practices while they are making decisions regarding what collections and projects get digitized. And then um, we have at least one person here who put in the Archives for Black Lives. Um, just because you were Dorothy, I believe you were actually um, a consultant on. Um, but yeah, I would say I recommend that. I'll be really quick to answer because I know we're past time. But I would recommend that. I think SL's article on um, anti-racist digitization selection criteria is really good. Um, and then I think also something that I find really compelling that fact you might be internally compelling is that at Cornell, there was a student a student demands from a black student union. And one of their demands was for more African American special collections materials to be digitized. And I think that that's a fantastic example because it's really hard to have that quantitative data of faculty student demand. But I think that that's the sort of thing we often ignore. We think of this a lot as like a intellectual problem to solve or, you know, balancing scales in a vacuum. But there's actually quite a bit of desire from patrons who would be our star patrons if we made ourselves more present to them. I think that's fantastic. I think at this point, there's always way more we could talk about. But I think I'll, I'll, I'll thank you for your time. Um, I'll say I wish we could all clap. Um, I know these are very anticlimactic endings to, to webinars these days, but please know um, we are very, very thankful, Dorothy. And everybody, thank you for coming. Um, check your emails. We'll let you know when this is up uh, on the LDL site for viewing as a recording. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out at any time. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.